What does these guys, this boat, car, airplane thing, this engine, and Studebaker, Packard, Mercedes-Benz have to do with each other? We'll stick to the end, we'll connect the dots, and discuss the fabulous history behind the Curtis Wright Engine Company and their connection to Mercedes-Benz. We are back at the Commemorative Air Force Museum located at the Falcon Field Airport in beautiful Mesa, Arizona. If you are ever in Mesa, Arizona, I highly recommend visiting this museum. These are working restored airplanes that you can purchase tickets to take a ride and take a step back in history. Truly remarkable experience. This is a B-25 that you can ride in. They have a B-17 and even a World War I biplane that you can take a ride in. I'm going to have to do that one of these days. They have many other airplanes on display here. Some fighter airplanes and jet airplanes, jet aircraft, uh, even a drone. But really what caught my eye is the number of engines that they have on display here on engine stands so you can get a real close look at them. This B-25 and also the B-17, this B-17 here, are powered by the Curtis Wright Twin Cyclone R2600 engine, 14 cylinder making 1750 horsepower. Truly a remarkable engine. Now the Wright name sounds familiar to you, but what about Curtis? Let's dig into a little bit of the history of the Curtis Wright Airplane and Aeronautic Company. Yes, the Wright in the Curtis Wright Company is the Wright Brothers, Orwell and Wilbur Wright, the first to take flight in a powered aircraft. Not as well known as the Wright Brothers was Glenn Curtis, the other half of the Curtis Wright Company. Now, Glenn Curtis, like the Wright brothers, had a bicycle shop. One day, Glenn Curtis saw a ad for a motorcycle, but could not afford a motorcycle, so he started building his own engines and building motorcycles himself. He, this turned into a great business for him and started marketing these motorcycles. In 1903, Glenn Curtis, without a formal education, just repairing bicycles and having some mechanical ability, built the first V-twin engine and installed it here in his motorcycle called the Hercules. Curtis's marketing strategy was simple, take his motorcycles out into any race he can and he would most likely win, which he did and this would gain notoriety and publicity for his new motorcycle company. One day he showed up at a race with a new invention. This was an air-cooled V8 motor for his motorcycle. This motorcycle was so far ahead of its time and so far ahead of the competition that the promoter of the race wouldn't let Curtis race this motorcycle. They did, however, provide him with a wide open track to see how fast this motorcycle could go. It ended up achieving 136 miles an hour in 1906. He was then recognized as the fastest man on earth, even faster than the most modern locomotives of that day. Around this time, an inventor named Thomas Baldwin asked Curtis to build him a lightweight engine to power his blimp to give it propulsion. And that's where it all started. Now Curtis is interested in flight. By 1905, the Wright brothers have fully developed their system for 
allowing the airplane to turn and bank in a turn. This was done with a group of pulleys and cables that would cause the wing to twist. One side twist down, the other side twist up, which would allow the airplane to bank and make it a turn. They were very concerned about somebody copying this design and filed for a patent in 1905. And because they were so concerned about somebody stealing this idea, they ended up parking the aircraft for over two and a half years while waiting for the patent to be issued. This delayed the further development of the Wright Brothers aircraft while opening the door and allowing Glenn Curtis to continue to develop his airplane. In 1908, Glenn Curtis won in his airplane, nicknamed the June Bug, the Scientific America Trophy, along with the prize money of $25,000. This money helped Glenn Curtis continue to develop his aircraft business. The Wright brothers pursued an arduous lawsuit for patent infringement against Glenn Curtis culminating in the advent of World War I where the federal government stepped in stopping the lawsuit ordering that the two companies must work together to support the war effort. Wilbur Wright tragically died in 1913 from typhoid fever leaving Orville Wright to continue on the family business. Glenn Curtis continued to innovate he was accredited for holding the land speed record and the airspeed record at the same time. He received the very first pilot's license. He also sold the very first airplane in his corporation to a private individual. He invented the ailerons, a system that is still in use on airplanes today, and also the very first seaplane to land and take off on the water, and then also the very first aeronautic school, pilot school to train future pilots. The two companies merged in 1929, creating the Curtis Wright Company. Soon they found themselves supporting another war effort. This time it was World War II. The Curtis Wright Company helped win the war for the Allies by supplying great reliable engines such as the R1820, the R2600, and this engine, the R3350. This engine is a special engine, the R3350, because it used a turbo impeller that took exhaust gases as they were exiting the exhaust through the exhaust pipes, spun an impeller that was connected through gear sets that would actually connect to the crankshaft to provide extra horsepower to the engine. Quite different from a conventional turbocharger that used exhaust gases to compress air into the intake manifold. This 18 cylinder engine was able to create 3500 horsepower and get great fuel economy while carrying very heavy loads and that was important because this engine was developed to go into the B-29 Super Fortress bomber that carried the bomb to Japan in the Enola Gay. After World War II the Curtis Wright Corporation decided to try their hand in the automobile business. They developed this air car. The advertising read Without the usual wheels, axles, transmission, clutches, etc., the Curtis Wright air car travels smoothly over any unobstructed terrain across water, mud, or swamps on a cushion of low pressure, low velocity air. The controls are simple. The vehicle is inherently stable. Anyone who can drive a car can operate an air car. Despite all the efforts testing and development of the air car, it never quite made it into production. In 1956, the Curtis Wright Corporation signed an agreement with the Studebaker Packard Company 
and Daimler Benz to use the Studebaker Packard dealer network to import Mercedes-Benz automobiles. Their advertising read that this merger will bring the world's finest domestic and import automobiles under one roof. As Studebaker Packard finally filed bankruptcy, this left many of those early dealers left with just the Mercedes-Benz franchise, which turned out not to be such a bad thing. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed exploring this history and making the video. If you did, it would be much appreciated if you could subscribe to my channel and give me a thumbs up. I'll see you on the next video.